G'day, my name's Lloyd Grolleman, I'm the Aussie Pastor and I want to give you a warm welcome to our program tonight. I want to welcome back for the second program in a row, do you know we've never done this? Wow. Pastor John Lomakang. Good to be back Lloyd. Now last week you told us an amazing story. You're abandoned by your mother. That's right. Brought up by your babysitter. Mm -hmm. Man, that is some story, isn't it? How you kind of wandered out and away from the Lord and got caught up in gangs and stuff. And then you met this beautiful woman. That's right. And my life changed amazingly. The Lord sent into my life the woman he knew I needed. And uh, what happened after that was all because the Lord chose the perfect woman for me. You know, we say nobody's perfect, but the Lord knew exactly that she was not just to be my wife, but everything connected to her, where we're going to move and all those aspects of meeting my mom. It was amazing. The Lord knew that this was the person for the rest of the story. So it'd be fair to say, or you'd believe this anyway, that behind every good man is an even better woman. That's right. I'm the fortunate half because she's the better half. <laughs> now, I, I had the the privilege just last Sabbath of hearing you share this story. And I've got to tell you, it's very emotional and it's very powerful. And I think you'll be drawn closer to Jesus as you listen to it. Thank you, Pastor John. Welcome back to the continuation of a story that's amazing. Uh, I'll begin with my dad. My dad was a jazz musician and uh, Johnny Parker was his name. That was his stage name, John Parker was his name. I never really knew him. I met him at 13 years old. Um, he just walked into my life one day, didn't even know him. For years I didn't even know what my dad looked like, uh, had no idea that he even existed until after Mama Haynes passed away. At the tender age of 13, a man pulled up in front of my house and introduced himself to me. He said, your name must be John. I said, yes it is. He, had a, he was in a car for a uh, long black Cadillac and with one foot on the floor he was just I guess planning to come into the house he said your name must be John I said yes it is he said and, and you're 13 I said yes I am and your sister is 16 and her name is Vivian and yeah 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 how do you know that and he said I'm your dad I said no you're not you're not my dad my dad's in the house and in the house uh, Papa I was calling Papa. Mr. Haynes was with his cousins. They were playing Calypso, you know, from the West Indies. And I ran in the midst of all that noise and I said, Papa, there's a man outside who said he's my dad. He said, what did he say his name is? I said, he told me his name is Johnny. He said, yeah, that's your dad. And, and that's how I met my dad, 13 years old. Met my dad. Uh, he walked into my life. Famous jazz musician, Johnny Parker. Kind of, if you put his name on the internet, you might, might find out more about him than I probably even found out yet. He played with all the jazz greats, and for the next 20 or 30 years he was in my life, didn't know very much about him. But um, my wife and I, kind of catapulting to this beautiful story, my wife and I, after marriage, moved down to Orlando, Florida, and the Lord worked it out that I came involved, I got involved in a Christian talent search, um, left my pool stick behind in New York, my gambling life turned over my life to Jesus and I got involved in a Christian talent search, a music talent search that is, and I came in among the top 10 finalists. The Lord worked that out. As a result, every hour on the hour, uh, the radio station would announce the top 10 finalists and my name, uh, John Lomakang, was mentioned. But two years before that, something amazing happened. When I was still working in New York City, uh, the bank I worked for asked me for a copy of my birth certificate. I never had a copy of it, never knew the original certificate, never saw it. And in it I found out something I never knew. One was, my sister wasn't the only one I was raised with. My sister being the only one I was raised with was my only sibling. I found out I had one more sibling. And she told me, yes, we have a brother. And my birth certificate, I guess, confirmed that because it said two children born before me. It gave the address where my mother was living when I was born, and also my mom's name, Rosario Maria Lomacang. And that was amazing, because here I am in Orlando after the talent search. My name is mentioned on the radio every hour on the hour, and there's a lady listening to this broadcast that was moved with the idea that I had the very same last name she had. And she called the radio station 
gave them her phone number and they called me at work on Friday morning and told me, call this woman who wants to meet you. She said that somehow you guys are related. And I thought, how's that possible? All my life I've been looking for my mom and somebody comes out of the clear blue and tells me they're related to me. So I called her and you know, the conversation, I found out her first name and, and I said, are you the one that wants to talk to me? She said, yes. Uh, and I said, well, uh, are you Teresa? She said, yes. I said, well, well, you know, you said that you wanted to talk to me. Well, kind of tell me your story. And she says, well, my name is Teresa. Uh, I was born and raised in the Virgin Islands. I'm, I'm of Filipino descent. Um, I am... I was looking for my dad, she said, or, or I don't know what happened to my father. And she said, well, you know, my dad one day, we heard that he died or we heard that he was killed. We were not sure what happened to him because he just disappeared out of our lives. And she said, I was thinking that maybe, maybe he left the Virgin Islands, uh, this Filipino man who was a fisherman, maybe he left the Virgin Islands and went to the mainland. Uh, they call that like Miami, Florida. Maybe he went to Florida and began a new family. She said, maybe that's why you have the same last name that I have. And I thought, wow. And, and then she said, well, tell me something about you. And I said, well, my name is John. I have a sister named Vivian. I have a niece named Taisha. And she said, that's, that's strange. I said, well, what's so strange about that? And she says, the John and the Vivian part is really strange. I said, and what's so strange about that? She said, well, she said, I have a sister named, I have a sister who has a, who said she had two children, uh, one named John and another named Vivian, but every time we asked her about where her children are, she could never tell us, never produce any evidence, never show us anything. And then she asked me the question that really, as it were, stopped and started a new clock in my life. She said, by any chance, uh, is your mother's name Rosario? I said, yes, it is. It's Rosario Maria Loma King. And I, I was at work dressed in a suit. I was sitting behind my desk. I dropped the phone. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't hardly talk. I just began to cry profusely because this shocking moment that I had been waiting for all my life, I sensed in my very being it was coming to pass right before me in that very pulsating moment. And, and um, I couldn't say very much. All I could just do was pick up the phone and I asked, is she alive? Is she alive? Tell me, is she alive? And, and the lady stopped and said, yes, your mother's alive and she's living in the Virgin Islands. And if I meet you, I could see whether or not you're Rosie's son. Well, armed with that, that information, she told me where she worked and, and I thought, okay, great, great. This is wonderful. So I called my wife with every intention to tell her everything that happened. My wife was at work and, and I said, Angie, she said, what? I said, something happened. She said, what? I said, something wonderful happened. She said, well, what? I said, something marvelous. And I couldn't get past the word marvelous and wonderful. And I said, just meet me at your job. I'm, I'm just coming to pick you up and wait for me and I'll tell you the rest of the story. Well, I was working for a Christian ministry and, you know, I'm already in shock. I'm, I'm already in shock. I don't know what to do. And I'm, I began walking around the office and uh, this is amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm walking around saying these words, She's alive, she's alive, and, and they, they know that he's alive, but who is she? And, and then I got to the front receptionist area, and she said, who's alive? I said, my mother, she's alive. Can you take me to my wife's job to pick up my wife? And, and the receptionist kind of in a frustrated way said, yes, get off my desk. I'll take you to your wife's job. Well, my wife and I now go home and change, and on our way to this to this company, this uh, called Hartford Insurance Company, I never forgot that. And I walked into the lobby, and as I walked into the lobby where where this lady that I was talking to on the phone worked, um, who said she was my mother's sister, I forgot her last. I didn't remember her last name. And I said, "Do you have anybody working here with the name Teresa?" They said, "Do you have a last name?" I said, "No." <laughs> and um, wasn't about 15 minutes they found out where she was and they told me third floor and my wife and I went up to the third floor and there I am standing you know in this uh, big room desks everywhere and people at their desk working and I guess whatever they did and I saw this lady walking walking towards me and I'm looking at her and I'm thinking huh and I'm sure she's thinking the same thing huh never seeing me and I never saw her 
And she kept walking up to me until she got really, really close and, and extended her arms and she grabbed my hands and she said, yes, your rosy son, I could see it in your face. This is, this is the picture of the lady that um, I met that day. This is my mom's sister, uh, Teresa. Uh, Teresa Milner, but Loma Kang is what she changed her name back to a little later on. And she hugged me and she cried and I began to cry. My wife began to cry and they said, Teresa, go to lunch. Just go to lunch. And, and uh, she sat me down and, and she said, oh, John, I've got to tell you about your family. She says, I'm the oldest of six girls. Your mother's next in line. There were four more after her. And she says, come over tonight to my house and We'll call your mom, and uh, and we'll try to get her to come to Orlando for the for the final talent search. And uh, what I didn't know, she says, by the way, I've got ten children of my own, and I'm going to make some phone calls, and you'll meet most of them tonight with uh, their children. And and I thought this is amazing. I began work that day with no natural family. And uh, this, is a, this is the family that I met that night. All these uh, first cousins and their children, and there I am standing in the, in the back there. My wife is uh, on the left side of the picture. And I began the day with no family, and I ended the day with all this brand new family that embraced me and took me in as though we had never been separated. That evening, uh, my aunt said, let's call your mom. And she said, now you get on that phone and I'll be on this phone. You listen, don't say anything. We're going to try to convince her to come to Orlando for the final talent search. And uh, we'll have her sit in the audience, have your name mentioned, and have her come out. And I thought, how's that going to work? And uh, so we're on the phone now. And I'm listening and she's trying to convince my mom to come to Orlando, Florida, from the Virgin Islands, St. Thomas. And she's just not budging, and the phone call wasn't successful. And she says, oh, well, I guess we're going to try to figure out another way. Well, I, don't, I, I, don't only have, uh, I didn't only have her, but I had four other aunts. And one of my aunts, Gloria, uh, you might see her in this picture she has on the white outfit. Uh, my Aunt Teresa said, we'll tell Gloria. Gloria knows Rosie very well. We'll tell her to tell Rosie what happened. And so I remember the story very well. She says, uh, um, by now, let me just insert this, by now, uh, the, the news gets out in Orlando that this young man, somebody at my job leaked the story that John finds his mother and the news crew shows up at my house on a, on a, on a hot uh, evening in Florida with the television camera. Are you the guy that met his mother? Are you the guy that found his mother? Are you the guy that, and I hadn't met her yet, but uh, all of a sudden, I became the lead story that evening in, in Central Florida, in Orlando. Central Florida man finds his mother after 25 years. News at 6, news at 11. And what an amazing thing it was. But by now, uh, my sister comes down from New York, and my aunt is now telling my mom this story. And my, aunt, my mom has no idea. So my aunt Gloria says, Rosie, what would you do if we told you we found somebody special? She said, well, I'd be happy. What would you do if we told you we found your son and daughter? And uh, she said, did you? Uh, my aunt said, yes, we did. And your son and your daughter are now in Orlando. Your, your daughter lives in New York. He lives in Orlando. But they want to meet you. They're in Orlando waiting for you. And uh, they said, for the first time in more than 11 years, um, my mom began to cry. And I, I, I never forgot. I, never, I, I remember asking my aunt when I was listening to my mom's voice on the phone, I remember asking her, why can't I say something to my mom on the phone? And she said, well, it's just not that simple. Your mom was so tired of people asking about her children that uh, she says, um, my children died in a fire in New Jersey. And so she said, as far as your mother's concerned, you're dead. So if you said anything, it would have thrown her into the left field. And I'm gonna, I want to insert this here because this is really important. You know. Uh, my, I was born to a mom and a dad that were not married. And, you know, in society they call the child illegitimate. They say, well, he's born to unwed parents. He's illegitimate. But my, my wife and I have been traveling the world, and I just want to correct that because I believe, I don't believe I'm illegitimate. I believe that my parents were the ones that were illegitimate. I believe that I came into the world the way that God ordained 
Life is not an illegitimate act, and I'm not an illegitimate child. I am a child of God. And so somebody may be in the same situation. I just want to encourage you. The way you were born may not be the way that you hoped it to happen, but because you're alive, you are a son or daughter of God. Well, now getting back to the story, uh, I got home from church that day and my wife's aunt said, call your mother. She wants to speak to you. I called my mom. The phone rang. She picked it up. John, mom, I mean, what do you say after 25 years? And, it, it, and I said, I heard her. She just kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I said, Mom, don't say that. I forgive you. I'm just glad God brought us back together. And she said, you forgave me? She said, I just did this because I loved you. The, the Haynes had every, everything I couldn't give to you. I said, Mom, that's okay. And so uh, there were so many things that happened after that. But then the date was set. Now the media set the date for July 4th for us to meet. We moved it to July 5th. To, to avoid the media circus. Went to the airport, my sister, my aunt, my cousins, my wife, we all went to the airport to meet my mom. The plane arrived, everybody came off the plane, it looked like she wasn't coming, and I said to my aunt, what happened? And she said, well, your mom probably got nervous and got off the plane. Okay, and then as we were walking away from the terminal, there she is, my mom walked off and walked right up to me. I'm, I'm six, two and a half, six, three on a good day, and my mom walks up to me, she's about all of five feet maybe maybe 95 pounds and she said to me how did you get so big and I said mom I grew and there's a picture of my mom and my sister and I meeting for the first time in the airport that day you know I wish I had a ton more time but I want to just tell you what happened that day the Lord opened the door for me to begin a new journey I joined the Heritage Singers after that I stayed with them for two years after that I came back to Orlando Florida my mom was an alcoholic my mom did not know the Lord my mom smoked two to three packs of cigarettes a day and I was praying. I said, Mom, pray for some, pray that God will deliver you. Get somebody to pray for you to be delivered. And we, we communicated off and on. In 1987, I began pastoral ministry. In 1988, I got my first church. My wife and I were pastoring up in the mountains of Northern California. And um, one, day I got, one day I got a call from my mom and uh, I said, um, hi. She said, John, this is mom. I said, Hi, Mom. <laughs> she says, uh, guess what? I said, well, she said, I'm coming to live with you. I said, really? And I'm thinking, smoking, alcohol, demons in her life. What do I do with that? And then she, she, she showed me, she told me something that just really broke my heart. She said, you know what? You told me many times to get somebody to pray for me, and I did. And somebody prayed for me. And the Lord delivered me, John from alcohol and cigarettes. She says, it's been six months now, no cigarettes, no alcohol, I don't even have the desire. And her life began to come together in a beautiful way. Well, you know, to, to encapsulate this journey, my mom went back to school, got a certificate, but the Lord had this special gift he, he put together for me. I gave my first evangelistic series as a pastor in 1988, 89, I believe it was, and the Lord worked it out that my mother was my very first baptism. I mean, my very first baptism as a pastor, can you believe it? My mother was my first baptism. There's the picture of her there standing with me in Trinity River in a place called Trinity County. And I baptized her in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what an amazing blessing that day. And uh, our lives took off in a beautiful way. Uh, but something happened, something happened because of all the years. That, that she was smoking. She went back and got a job, um, began to work, and there was a little bit of time between us. And one day she called us and said, hey, come visit me. And I went to visit her and she complained about a pain in her back. And she came to find out that that pain in her back uh, turned out to be cancer. The doctors told me she had cancer. And it, and it really traumatized us. And I said, well, doc, what do I do? And he said, make the next six months of your mother's life the best time she's ever known. And it was at the bedside of my mom as she was passing away that I met my brother. And the story was completed there, my brother, my sister, and me, at the bedside of my mom. And there's one thing that I want to say before I just almost wind up the story. You know, my mom took all the chemotherapy, but then she was about to lose the battle to cancer. And one day she said to me, John, if and when I die, could you do me a favor and tell the family about the Jesus I found, about the truth I found, about the Lord I found? 
and uh, and then she lost her battle to cancer and closed her eyes and rest but I'm looking forward to the day when I can meet her again that's why this song just be there is so important to me you know I'm looking forward and I want to encourage you whatever happens in your life make up your mind to determine that all the difficult things all the hardships in life make up your mind as my mom said to me when the Lord comes John just be there and I encourage you friends when Jesus comes I pray that you will just be there that's when the joys of our life will just really begin cradled in my arms I held you and I loved you more with each day passing by Sharing joy, sharing pain Through the sunshine and the rain I can't believe it's time to say goodbye I don't know what the future brings you but I hope that you will keep heaven as your goal for I taught you how to pray and I made sure you knew the way so remember my request before you go just be there when we finally make it home and when we stand before the throne, just be there. So when I turn around to see if you'll be standing next to me, just be there. It's not an easy road you're traveling But every place that you go, Jesus has been So if you find you've made a turn Forgetting what you've learned You may have to start all over It's not an easy load you're bearing But the trials of your faith will make you strong Facing danger unaware He won't allow what you cannot bear So my prayer is that your faith will be think back now on the fact that uh, my life is a miracle not because I am a special person but because I belong to a special person who has 
increase the value in my walk. And I want to encourage you today, there may be somebody watching this program that may be struggling with identity, may be wondering where their mom or dad is, or maybe don't even know their family. I want you to know, as I've discovered in a beautiful way, that not only do I have an earthly family, but I am a part of a heavenly family. And uh, discouragements do come. My wife and I face challenges as the journey of this life is all about. But one day, when our journey is over, we'll discover that not only were we never alone, not only are we a part of a heavenly family, but when the day comes that uh, we stand before our Lord, we'll discover that through the trials and the tribulations and the hardships and the disappointments that our Savior never left us. And so let me encourage you, wherever your life may be, continue trusting God. He'll work out all the details of your life, and one day when you see Him, He'll be able to welcome you into that heavenly family. May God bless you until we see you again. I really enjoyed that testimony, Pastor. Praise the Lord. God will never abandon us. And that's the good news. And I'll tell you what really touched me about that was that you were able to have a significant part in bringing your mother to Jesus. Yes, yes. And only the Lord could have done that. I mean, how do you take a child abandoned for so long, connect him, and then his first baptism as a pastor becomes his mother? Only God can do that. It's teary stuff, actually. Mm -hmm. And I just want to encourage you out there, some of you who follow Jesus, maybe a son or a daughter or a mum or a dad, mm -hmm. not following him. And your heart aches from this hope in this story, isn't there? That very much. I mean, if God can work the miracle for John Lomacang, he, he can work the miracle for you. Amen. Amen. Now, you do sing. That's right. We can pick up your music somewhere. Yes, at johnlomacang.com. That's J-O-H-N-L-O-M-A-C-A-N-G.com. You can listen to them. And there'll be some additional uh, items on there, too, that are not on the program today. But I know that... God will allow them to be a blessing. Actually, how many CDs have you done? I have three CDs and a DVD and a book that I'm going to be putting back into circulation about my life story, which is entitled Abandoned But Not Alone. So look for that coming up pretty soon. I really enjoyed that story and I've enjoyed this man's ministry. Powerful, powerful testimonies. And that's why next year I've invited you back. Praise the Lord. Looking forward to it. Now, God willing, and we always say God willing because we right. never know the future. That's right. You'll be back here in this studio at New Hope Adventist Church sharing another series. Can I say it like this? It'll rock your socks off. That's a good way to say it. <laughs> so thank you, Pastor Loma King, from my heart. Thank you for coming and sharing your story with us. God be with you. We'll see you next year. By God's grace. I'm Lloyd Groleman and I'm the Aussie pastor and I love you, I love you a whole heap, but praise God, He loves you a whole lot more. See you next time.